Hi, I'm Lauren. And I'm Camille. We're research specialists at the Family History Library, and we're here to talk to you about how you can use a DNA test to find an unknown ancestor. Now, there's a lot of different types of tests out there. Camille, would you mind talking us through the top three types? Sure. First, we have Y-DNA. Now, this is going to be following your direct paternal line or your father's 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 line. And this can go back hundreds of years because it changes very slowly over time, typically. And only men can test for this one. So if you're interested in following that paternal line, you'll have to find a brother or a cousin or a father or someone else to test for you as a man. There's also mitochondrial DNA testing, which is to follow your direct maternal line or your mother's 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 line. And this one is similar to the Y DNA in that it changes very slowly. So again, you can connect with people who connect with you at a kind of distant level going back hundreds of years. Then again, anyone can test with this one. So if you're a man, a woman, it doesn't matter. Anyone can do it. Then there's also an autosomal testing, which is the most popular. And it's also the least expensive option. Now this one is a little bit different than the other two in that it can cover DNA uh, that you've inherited from any one of your ancestral lines, not just your direct maternal or direct paternal lines. So this, this is very helpful when trying to build out other parts of your tree. Now keep in mind though, that this only goes back approximately four to six generations due to inheritance patterns. Lauren, do you wanna tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Each of us inherit 50% of our DNA from our father and 50% from our mother. And our parents have both inherited 50% of their DNA from each of their grandparents, which means that I have approximately 25% of each of my grandparents' DNA inside of me. Of course, that also means that I'm missing out on 75% of their DNA. And so the further back I go, the less DNA of an individual person I have that I'm able to use to compare to other descendants to break through brick walls. And so that's why Camille said you can only go back about four and five generations because after that, the amount of DNA that I have from that ancestor is so small, it's really hard to make any sort of firm conclusions about my relationships with other people. But as long as we're staying in that Goldilocks window, um, there is a way that we can test in order to find unknown ancestors. And remember, if you're looking for someone who's outside of that window for you, think about your grandparents, think about your uncles and aunts or great uncles and aunts. Because, you know, if someone's eight generations away from me, they're only six generations away from my grandma. And so instead of taking an autosomal DNA test myself, I should test my grandma because it puts us a lot closer to that unknown relative and allows us to focus in on matches from them. So Camille, exactly how big picture can we use autosomal DNA to identify an unknown ancestor? Sure, so in each of the DNA testing companies, you will get a list of matches. So these are people who've also tested with the same company and you've been compared against each of them and you'll only get the match list for those that you actually share DNA with. So this is helpful when you're looking for specific ancestors because you can do a thing called clustering in your match list. So clustering is exactly what it sounds like. You're going through all of your matches and depending on where they come from on your family tree, you put them into little clusters. And this is something that you can do pretty simply by looking at your shared matches. And I'm going to show you an example so this is my match list on my heritage, one of the companies where you can do autosomal DNA testing. And you can see I have gone pretty far down my match list because in this case, let's say I want to try to find an unknown great great grandparent on my mother's line. Everyone that I'm matching as a close relative or maybe like a first cousin is only matching me probably through a grandparent or a great grandparent. In order to get further back, I'm gonna go into this thing where the company is estimating that we're, in this case, third to fifth cousin. And let's say that when I look at match 22, who already has a family tree that they've uploaded, which has information on them, their parents, and all of their ancestors, the company's actually already compared it and found out that we're related. And in this case, it found out that we're related through that ancestor who I want to know where they were born and who their parents were. I'm descended from one of their children. She's descended from another child. 
And this is great because I know that we both share the DNA of that ancestor who I want to find more information about. So what I can do is under the information for this match, which once again, every company has this shared matches in common with family, shared family feature, I can look at all of the people who share DNA with me and with this match. And once again, I'm gonna skip my parents, I'm gonna skip my first cousins, and I'm gonna go down till I see people who I have no idea how they're related to me, but I know that these people have been clustered so that all of them are at least related to me through this person who I want to know more about. Now, a lot of you aren't going to have this magical moment where you find someone who's related to you exactly through that person you want to learn more about. But what you can do is start by finding someone, maybe a first cousin, who you know. For me, I'm trying to find someone on my mom's side. So find a first cousin who's related to you on your mom's side and then cluster all of your shared matches. So now you have everyone that's from your mom's side. And then find someone who's related to along that line we're going to and cluster all the shared matches into a different list. And that way you can sort of, by cutting in half and cutting in half and cutting in half, find that cluster of people who you believe are all related to that ancestor you want to know more about. So that's right. And sometimes our matches don't have trees. So in Lauren's example, thank goodness that that one match had a really great tree and it matched up really well with Lauren's tree. So they knew that, that, that they were related in that way. Sometimes we, we don't have a family tree for those people in our match list or even in our little cluster that we've identified that we wanna look at. So in that case, we'll have to just do traditional genealogy research with our regular documents to build out their tree. And eventually we'll hopefully be able to find out how each of the people in the cluster matches each other and eventually then to us. And you've done that a couple of times, and I believe you have an example of one of the times where you've been able to find it on an ancestor through building out those match trees. Is that right? I do. Oh, Let me show you. Show. Okay, so here's an example of one of our clusters. So at the bottom of this chart, you can see matches A through H. Okay, and they're all highlighted in red because these are the people from our match list. Now, when in we when we have our clusters. Not everyone will have a tree, but hopefully a few of them will have at least small trees that you can build on to have a foundation for your little cluster. So let's say someone in this little match group had a small family tree. And as you're building out, you suddenly find, you know, that, oh, I see that these two also had a small tree and you built that out and you find out that they're all descended from Teresa. That's excellent. That's a great place to start. Then you can keep building and building and building. And of course, not just building back, but, but building uh, the tree down in time. So more to the present, because of course your testers are gonna be living people. So you have to build the tree down to the present as well. So eventually you'll be able to see that your, your little cluster here is all, they're all descended from this Wilhelm and Catherine. Now this is really important because this means that you too, as uh, a DNA match to these people are also somehow related to Wilhelm and Catherine. Now, we don't know yet uh, if Wilhelm and Catherine are your direct ancestors. It depends on how much DNA you're sharing, but it could be that, you know, Wilhelm or Catherine's sibling is your ancestor or, or something like that. Yeah, and so as you continue to build out this clusters tree and comparing it to your tree, eventually one day, you'll be able to get them to intersect. That's right. That's awesome. Now remember, there are limitations to this. The further back in time you go, the harder it will be to use DNA to solve problems. Also, many of the DNA testing companies have databases that are very strongly American filled. And so if you're looking for a problem out of Europe, you won't have as many matches who directly descend from those people. There are ways to get around that. We've already talked about testing your older relatives. Another great idea is to test as, at as many companies as you can. Many companies allow you to upload DNA tests to their websites. So if you've already tested one company, check out the other major ones to see if for a small fee, you can transfer your DNA there. 
And there's so many other resources out there for things we haven't talked about and things we've only covered a little bit here, you know, for clustering and using other tools and resources to identify where your DNA matches can fit and doing traditional genealogy as well. My name is Matt Wright. I'm a content specialist at FamilySearch and Kara is a research specialist at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. And like I said, we're going to talk today about looking for ancestors in printed resources like books and newspapers. So Kara, what can you tell us? Hey, thanks, Matt. Well, I'm excited to be here today and spend a little time talking to you guys about finding your ancestors in printed books and newspapers. So there are so many details um, and stories about our ancestors' lives that can be found in printed books and published in newspaper articles. These details have been researched and gathered by individuals, uh, maybe historical associations, geneal genealogy societies, uh, and even companies over several years. And it has created a rich library of resources. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about these resources and how books and newspapers can help you learn more about your family's story. So a great place to begin looking for information about your ancestors is in printed books, specifically related to family histories and genealogies. Most of these books have been published and every day more and more of them are being digitized and made available online for free even. Um, so let's begin by learning a bit more about this great resource. I want to start by talking about printed books. Two key types of books for learning more about your ancestors are published family histories and genealogies. Essentially, these are compiled works by others that detail generational links within families. They list out details of a family group like when they were born, uh, who they married, um, when they died. They may also include specific details, such as the geographic location where your ancestor lived, um, personal stories about their lives, and source references. These types of books are a useful resource when you are beginning to explore your family's history. It's exciting to learn more about your ancestors. And these books are really helpful because they provide you with details about your family that others have already discovered. There's no sense in repeating research already done by someone else. Yeah, that's such a good point, Kara, because we, as, especially as you're beginning, you wanna get that as much of a head start as possible. Um, so if we're looking for these kind of resources, what's the best way to find them? And then once you do, like, what are some of the things you can find in them that are going to be helpful? Those are great questions. Um, yeah, you guys may be thinking as you're watching this video, this sounds great, <laughs> but how would I ever find something written about my family specifically? Well, um, there are actually a lot of ways to go about that. So first, printed family history books are commonly found at local libraries or academic libraries like um, universities and colleges, family history centers and libraries, um, historical societies, genealogical societies. These books are often housed in the geographic area. Um, maybe if your family lived in um, Salt Lake City, Utah, those genealogical books could be housed at uh, the Family History Library in Salt Lake or maybe one of the universities there in the Salt Lake area. Um, a quick internet search for libraries in an area your family is known to have lived will likely produce a list of repositories or libraries that you can then contact. Sometimes these libraries have an online presence, so you could go to their website, um, sometimes they have an online chat feature, or you could also email them or simply call them on the telephone. Another way to locate books on the genealogy of your family is to search the internet for digitized books. And there are four key websites that are great for this. And I wanted to just take a minute and show you those websites. Okay, so the first website I wanted to highlight is familysearch.org. 
And if you go to the search feature and scroll down to books, it will take you to a landing page to normally search digital library. And on this page, you're able to search in the digital library um, for books we've had digitized. And we have over 600,000 books that have been digitized. Another great website is Google Books. Um, Google has digitized a lot of family histories and genealogies. So you could come right here uh, and start searching for your family. You could search by their name, by their locality, or maybe some other unique feature uh, or identifying words that would um, help discern what family was yours. There's also um, Internet Archive, and their URL is archive.org. Um, this is a great website to also search for digitized books. You can see here, you can search for books and other things as well. And then the last one is Happy Trust. This is another great website to look for digitized books um, on your family history, um, your family genealogy. You go to those and search, like you said, for the name, for the locality, something that might bring up, something that might be a detail that, that could be brought up uh, for that family or for that place. Right, yeah. Um, you can search on all, all of these websites by your family name. Um, or maybe where they live, but yes, you really touched on a key point or other keywords that might distinguish them from another family. When you're at these websites, it's important to understand that books are not typically available in digital format for free until 70 years after the death of the author. This is known as copyright protection. But the great news is that lots of family histories and genealogies are no longer copyright protected because they were written so long ago. Oh, that's awesome. So would it would you be able to maybe show us uh, like a, a search for a book or a book that might have some some details about a family? So let me give you an example from the family search digital library. Um, I've done a lot of research on the merit family. So I'm going to come in here and just type merit family. Um, maybe I'll just pick merit just to search. There's a lot of different ways you can go about this, but let's just see what comes up. So these are all different types of records. Um, primarily, it looks like here, books, uh, genealogies have been submitted, family histories about the Merritt family. Um, and you can see here, like this book, there are other surnames that are written about. Here, I, I know I've used this book in my research on the Merritt family. Um, so let's see here. It says Revised Merit Records. Um, and if you want to know a little bit more about this book, you click on it. And here it's going to give you more details about the author. It looks like the front page has been scanned. And then if you want to um, explore the book, you would click View All Pages. Oh, and then you need to log in. Um, it's free. Let me do this here. So free, you just have to have an account that that access to to materials on Family Search is free. Yeah. yeah sorry, <laughs> I kind of stopped midstream because I couldn't do two things at once. Okay. Yeah, um, it is free to have an account. So if you don't have an account, just create one, and then you're able to access all the records at Family Search. So here, I want to view the pages. Um, again, it gives you some information. I'm just going to close that. And there's many ways to view the book, but you could even just go page by page. Um, I usually start that way so I can read um, the beginning, what the book's about, and see the table of contents to see what I um, want to explore. But you can also, there's a lot of different options down here. You can view a thumbnail version. That's another way to kind of quickly scroll through the book once you've identified kind of the general area where you want to search. And I know earlier you mentioned we were going to talk about books and you also mentioned newspapers. So do you want to tell us a bit about that? The second resource that I wanted to highlight to help you guys learn more about your family are newspapers. Um, newspapers were printed on a regular schedule. 
sometimes daily or biweekly or weekly. And those newspapers were printed in the local area and related information to the individuals in the community about local residents, uh, what the happenings were in the community and newsworthy events. So for genealogical purposes, newspapers chronicle those newsworthy events and people. They often will publish death notices, obituaries, marriage license applications, um, birth announcements, just all kinds of really great genealogical gems. And this is where you can glean all sorts of interesting information about your ancestors. Uh, these are unique details and sometimes really funny stories. And the particulars about a person that really personalize them and make them um, unique and memorable in, um, in your mind. And uh, these great details are often found in newspaper articles and may not be found in other types of genealogical records. What, what are some good ways to track down uh, newspapers and, and see if there's anything that, that is about our ancestors? Okay, yeah, let me show you that. I'm gonna show you some examples. Um, these are from the United States, though the principle behind identifying the paper is the same um, and would apply to other geographic areas. So to start, I'm gonna share my screen here in a minute. I wanna show you a website that the Library of Congress has. They've created a huge database that lists every newspaper known to be in print from 1790 to the present in the United States. These historic newspapers are typically copies on microfilm and are housed at different municipal libraries or academic libraries, church libraries, um, again, a whole variety of repositories, historical societies, genealogical societies. But this website identifies for you where they're housed. And on top of that, many of these newspapers have also been digitized and are available online. So let me show you this website. Okay, so here is the Library of Congress um, newspaper directory homepage. And um, are you okay if I just walk you through how to identify a paper? Yeah, that's perfect, yeah. Okay, okay, great. So um, this past week, I've been doing a lot of research in Nebraska and um, I'm trying to find an obituary for an individual. So I came to this um, newspaper directory page, and I'm going to select the state that I was researching in, which was Nebraska. And the county was Richardson. Oh, let's see here. There we go. Um, and then you can also narrow it down to city. You don't have to. Again, you can um, have your search be as broad or as narrow as you'd like. So sometimes you have to play around with it a little bit. Um, in this case, I am going to narrow it by city because I knew exactly where this individual had died. And then you um, give a time range and this website lets you do it in 10 year increments. So my um, the individual I was researching died in 1898. So I'm going to do 1890 to 1900. Okay, and then I hit search. And you can see here, um, some of them are red because I have used this website, like I said, to identify what I needed. But here you find a whole list of newspapers that were published in Fall City, Richardson County, Nebraska, um, between 1890 and 1900. And you can see here, there's some um, repetition, uh, and that may be because the um, type of newspaper, maybe they have it available on microfilm or hard copy, or sometimes what I see is the newspaper um, change names, just sometimes just slightly, and so they list it out that way. So when I'm at this website and I come here to this part where I've narrowed it to a specific area, I usually look for a paper that has a good run, right? So a big long time period where that paper was published. So here we go. Let's look at this one. Um, the Fall City Journal, 1882 to current. So I click on that. And then the 
database gives me a lot of details about the newspaper. Um, and what I think is really important is you scroll down here to the bottom, view complete holdings information. And that's going to list who has the paper. Okay, and so here you can see the Kansas State Historical Society has this newspaper. Um, I know from searching this one, then I, I clicked here on the next one. I wanted to see the paper on microfilm. Who had it on microfilm and for how long of a run? So again, I scroll down here to view complete holdings and you can see that the Nebraska State Historical Society Library has it and they have quite a few um, years covered. They do, don't they? And, and I was actually able to find my newspaper. I emailed the Nebraska State Historical Society Library and the librarian responded back to me, was very helpful and told me, hey, this newspaper has actually already been digitized. And so I was able to find it without her having to look up the obituary. Well, anything else you'd wanna tell us about newspapers? Yeah, um, just one more thing I wanna highlight is that um, I kind of touched on it, but many newspapers have been digitized and are available online. Um, some of those newspapers require a subscription and some do not. So I wanted to just share with you today um, a family search wiki page that highlights um, different newspaper, newspapers in the United States, uh, different resources to accessing them. So again, I'm gonna share my screen So here is a family search wiki page on United States newspapers. And the family search wiki is just such a great resource for whatever you're trying to explore, any record group or locality. But for purposes today, I wanted to show you this newspaper page. And if you go down, you just kind of scroll through and you can see here, it talks about historical newspapers. And the very first website it lists is the one I just showed you guys, that Library of Congress, how they have that newspaper database um, and they also have a lot of digitized newspapers on their site. So that's just the first one. And you can see here, the wiki page has listed all types of um, options for looking at digitized newspapers. And, and like you were saying, you know, some are free and some have a subscription. I know I've heard of Genealogy Bank and Newspaper Archive. And those are awesome resources. I mean, it, it's, it's nice to, that there are free ones to start with. And then depending on how important or urgent <laughs> that uh, that bit of information might be about an ancestor, it might be a great option uh, to be able to use one of these subscription. And, and, and you can check and see with them, you know, the, the duration and the cost and all that. But, you know, compared to what it used to be, you know, traveling to a library or, a, or a correspondence over postal mail, um, you know, even a, even paying for this kind of information is is often just exactly what you need. Yeah, absolutely. You touch on a great point. Um, in my research, I I do a lot of research, so I have joined a few of these subscription-based newspaper websites, and the top three seem to be Genealogy Bank, Newspaper Archive, and Newspapers. Um, dot com. So. Yeah, definitely explore your free resources. And then as you delve into your research further, you can look at those subscription sites. And often you can look at the subscription site to see if they have the paper you need and the time period you need before joining the site. So you know if it's gonna be worth it to get that subscription. Well, that's great. That's a great tip. Awesome. Well, Kara, thank you. This has been super helpful. And, and like I was saying earlier, I, I really feel like what you've, you've shared today is going to give people tools to do stuff right away. Uh, and, and that's super helpful. So we'll wish everyone who's watching happy searching. And thank you again, Kara. And we'll talk to you guys later.